Hello and welcome back to my channel, Civil War Reports. I am your War of the Rebellion reporter, Brian Thomas Kopak. And, well, today uh, is Saturday, February 17th, and I was planning on finishing up an episode I started last week. Unfortunately, Mother Nature had different plans because, uh, well, over the course of... Last night, Mother Nature decided to deliver us some snow. And uh, as you can see, my plans to hit the battlefield and other places to finish up last week's episode that I started have uh, kind of gone astray. So with that said, <sighs> gotta have other plans, but that's okay because I'm always prepared for such a contingency. And instead of being outside, well, we're gonna go back inside the house into my parlor and um, I'm gonna bring you a different episode than I uh, planned on doing today. And we're gonna take a look at two events that uh, really shook the South, one in the 1820s, one in the 1830s, and really started to bring the issue of slavery to the forefront. So we're gonna continue on with our series, Causes of the American Civil War. Come on in the house, and let's talk about some events. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Uh, what better way to spend a rather cold and snowy day than inside the warm house with you, my audience. Thank you very much for tuning in as we continue the series on causes of the American Civil War. And uh, I'm enjoying a mug of tea here out of my favorite drinking glass uh, dedicated to the Battle of Antietam with George McClellan on one side and Robert E. Lee on the other. Um, great way to spend a snowy day. So today we're going to be taking a look at and continuing my series on causes of the Civil War. Two events that had to do with slave, slave uprising. Uh, one in the 1820s, the other in the 1830s. First one we're going to take a look at is a gentleman by the name of Denmark Vesey, V-E-S-S-E-Y, um, who planned what would have been the largest slave uprising in United States history had it taken place. So what can we tell you about Denmark? Well, and that was his first name, Denmark. Um, not much is written about him, but from what has survived over the years, I can tell you this much. Uh, he was born in the year 1767 in the Dutch West Indies, and he was a self-educated man. So he was not a dumb man by any stretch of the means. He was self-educated, and again, he plotted what would have been the largest slave uprising had it actually occurred. So born in 1767, we're not sure exactly what month and day, but in 1781, when he was roughly about 14 or so years old, he was sold to the captain of a slave running ship, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Vesey, and that's where Denmark uh, picks up the surname. And um, about two years later in 1783, the captain, Joseph Vesey uh, settles in Charleston, South Carolina with his slave, uh, who's about, you know, 16 or so at the time. And um, from what I could gather, Denmark must have had some real skill with his hands. And it was not uncommon during the time of slavery in the United States that if a slave was naturally gifted, um, you know, with his hands or um, as a, a baker or a chef, that the owner would either sometimes rent the slave out to make extra money or allow the slave to uh, use his skills or her skills to make money for themselves. By the year 1800, 
Denmark had amassed $600, which was an incredibly large amount of money uh, in those days, to buy his own freedom. So in year 1800, he becomes a freed, self-educated black man living in the United States. And he quickly learns that a freed black man in the United States during that time period was at best a second-class citizen and denied many of the basic rights that a white person would have had. And it's because of this and because of what he's seeing and how he's seeing uh, uh, the chattel slavery that existed in the United States at the time that he gets very upset and he decides he wants to take some action. And in the year 1822, he has formulated a plot that would bring about a major slave uprising here in the United States. And the plot he envisions would be so big, uh, even historians today uh, believe it to be probably true, that he could have possibly amassed as many as 9,000 slaves to join his rebellion. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, and I, 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 think it, I think it is fortunate that on the eve of this plot going into action, he was betrayed by a house servant who told their master about it, who then notified authorities. And the reason why I say it's fortunate is because had this plot materialized, thousands I'm not exaggerating, I, at, at least hundreds, if not into the thousands of people, both white and slave, would have lost their lives, okay? And the repercussions on the slaves would have been horrendous, I believe. Um, and we've seen throughout history, when you have a plot of this size, uh, whether it's thwarted or it's carried out, a lot of times you will see a lot of innocent people who had nothing to do with the plot get sucked up, round up, and suffer consequences for something they didn't do. So while I cannot support slavery, will not support slavery, I, in my opinion, it was probably best that this plot did get stopped because it saved hundreds, if not into the thousands of lives. So what ended up happening? Well, after the plot was thwarted, there became a two-month manhunt to round up who was responsible for wanting to implement this revolt. And um, over the course of uh, those two months, uh, 130 black men and four white men were arrested. Uh, the four white men received pretty lengthy prison terms while 35 of that 130 black men, uh, including Vesey himself, were executed. And Denmark Vesey himself went to the gallows on July 2nd, 1822. But news of this potential plot did spread throughout the United States. And it really started to bring the issue of slavery uh, to the forefront on a human level. Not words on paper on the U.S. Constitution or words on paper for the Missouri Compromise, but really could put names with slavery. And um, today there is a monument, there's a statue for Denmark Vesey in Hampton Park in Charleston, South Carolina. And you know what? Uh, as this channel has said, I'm very glad that there, that, that exists because... This channel is all about telling the Civil War story, North, South, and what I call the third side, that of black Americans, whether they were freed or slaves. It's all part of U.S. history. And this channel firmly believes that we can have both monuments to the Confederacy and monuments to all the other groups and races that are in this country who have contributed to United States history. So I'm glad that monument stands because you know what? Denmark Vesey is really a footnote in American history, but perhaps people seeing that monument will inspire them to look up and read more about this man. So 
That's the story of Denmark Vesey. Let's take a look at a second and even more infamous rebellion, that being Nat Turner's rebellion. Okay, for the uh, second part of this video, we're going to be taking a look at Nat Turner's rebellion. And uh, for that, I use as my main source this book, History of the Confederacy, 1832 to 1865 by Clifford Downey, uh, originally copyrighted in 1955. It was uh, reissued in 1992, and uh, that's this version here. And I gotta say, this is probably a really overlooked book. It's uh, got a lot of information in it uh, for a book that's covering, um, you know, basically about 33 years of history, but it does start off not in 1832, but in 1831, and the first couple of pages are dedicated to Nat Turner's rebellion because that rebellion really did put names and faces on slavery. As I mentioned earlier, uh, prior to that, you had, um, you know, just words on paper, and slavery wasn't even mentioned in the Constitution. But now you actually had names. You had both the names of Nat Turner and some of the more prominent members of his uh, band, as well as uh, the white people who were killed. So let's take a look at this. Who, who was Nat Turner? Well, we could say this much about him. He was uh, born on October 2nd in the year 1800 in Southampton County, Virginia. And uh, Turner would go on to become a preacher and lead what would ultimately be the largest slave revolt in U.S. history. Uh, by the time Turner became an adult, um, the region that he lived in, uh, which is south of the James River, um, that area really had a larger slave population than it did a white population. There was about uh, 7,700 slaves to 6,500 white people. And that did cause a bit of a concern amongst the white people because, well, what would happen if a rebellion broke out? Uh, there'd be more slaves than white people, and that could be a problem. But we're going to see during um, the rebellion, uh, the worst fears did not come true. And one thing about Southampton County at that time, um, it really was closer to the economic conditions of people to their south, their North Carolinian brothers and sisters, as opposed to the large plantation population, uh, the large plantations that existed um, in Virginia, the more famous uh, plantations, you know, that grew really just a single cash crop, uh, whether that been tobacco or cotton. Um, the people in that part of Southern Virginia uh, really had I don't want to say small farms, but medium-sized farms where they grew a variety of crops. And Nat Turner's owner at that time, and I, it's, it's just so bizarre to refer to a person's owner, um, but that's terminology of the time, uh, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Travis, he uh, grew a variety of different crops. And he was also a coachman, so he was an, an artisan himself. He basically what would have been considered the middle gentry or what was also known at that time of the middling sort, basically what we would consider the modern-day middle class. And I really want to talk to you a moment about slavery because I need to dispel some popular myths. There is no universal... Uh, code for, for how slaves were treated. It really did depend from master to master and uh, really uh, the manager or overseer of the slaves. And by all accounts, it appears that Joseph Travis was a very um, benign type of master. Now, granted, yes, he owned people. 
There's no getting around that. But um, he did uh, allocate some of his land to his slaves for them to grow their own crops so they could either supplement or versify their diet, um, which he did not have to do. Uh, also, uh, according to uh, Clifford's book, Clifford Doughty's book, um, he also did not, by standards of the time, overwork his uh, slaves. Yes, they worked from sunup to sundown, Monday through Friday, but they only worked half a day on Saturday, Sundays they had off. And that same schedule, by all accounts, applied to Joseph Travis. Again, he was a coach maker, uh, so he himself was also working pretty much those same hours. Um, but again, I'm not trying to justify slavery in any sense of the word any, at all here. I'm just trying to point out that some of the stories that all of the slaves were treated horribly did not apply universally. It really was on a case-by-case, owner-by-owner basis. And again, I'm not trying to justify it. I'm trying to create a more accurate historical picture. Okay, with that said, let's take a look at the rebellion itself. What happened? Well, by August of 1831, Nat Turner is a preacher. Um, from all accounts, from what I can gather, he was a very educated, sorry, a very intelligent man. I don't know the extent of his education, if he was allowed to have any, but he was far from a dumb man. Okay, He was, uh, uh, I guess to use a modern term, he was very street smart, um, and he knew that he could persuade people to join his cause, and he did. His band actually started off very small. It was only roughly about eight people when they committed their first murders. So what happened? August 21st, 1831 was a Sunday. And at that time period, uh, it was not uncommon for white people to get together at what they called these uh, camp meetings where you know they discussed religious issues, prayed, uh, that kind of thing. And Nat Turner knew that, uh, well, Joseph Travis and his family would be away. And it was on that day that he starts to put his plan for this rebellion in motion. First thing they do is they pretty much raid Joseph Travis's uh, distillery. Again, Travis was a diverse farmer. He grew, had orchards. He grew all kinds of fruit. And... Uh, the gentleman that would take part in the rebellion first helped themselves to some of his apple brandy. So they got drunk. They waited until nightfall. They waited until the Travis family was asleep. Nat Turner climbed up onto the roof, snuck in through a window, went down the stairs as quietly as possible, uh, unlocked the front door, and welcomed in his co-conspirators. Now, in the beginning, they did not use club. I mean, they did not use muskets or pistols. It was uh, confined to clubs, hatchets, and axes. Uh, silent weapons. And the first person to fall victim to the Nat Turner Rebellion was Joseph Travis himself. Second was his wife, and um, the carnage continued in the house. Every white person in the house was killed, including his young son who basically had his head smashed up against the brick wall of the fireplace in his room. Uh, gives you an idea of the, I guess you could say anger or the desire to get this rebellion going. Um, they spared nobody. Uh, it, it was a very, very brutal murder in that home and that would be the case pretty much throughout the rebellion. So after the Travis family was killed, Nat Turner and the small group of men he had with him helped themselves to uh, their victims' clothes. And they began to fashion their own homemade style uniforms, including sashes around their waist. Uh, they really did view themselves as conquering heroes. And after the Travis family was murdered, they set off into the night to continue their carnage. Uh, next was 
Turner's, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Joseph Travis's wife's brother, who, uh, his name was Mr. Francis. Uh, he was a bachelor. He lived not too far away. And he was the owner of two of Nat Turner's original co-conspirators, uh, two slaves by the name of Will and Sam. And um, despite the fact that Mr. Francis was a rather strong man, uh, there was no way getting caught off guard in the middle of the night that he had any chance against several men armed with axes and um, he too was killed. Um, they also continued on their consumption of large amounts of alcohol. Uh, when the outlaws, and that's I guess the best way to describe them, reached the home of the widow Turner, uh, from what I could gather, no relation to Nat Turner, uh, on Monday morning. So again, this started on a Sunday, so here it is the next morning. Um, now, from what I could gather, Miss Turner lived in a, I, I want to say a plantation house, but she lived in a, a larger home than what would have been in the area, and it was uh, uh, very nice. Uh, first thing they did was they killed her overseer, the manager, uh, who just happened to be in uh, Mrs. Turner's distillery at the time. I'm sure they helped themselves to more alcohol. Uh, they stole his clothes and then proceeded to the house where they... Um, murdered Mrs. Turner and a friend of hers who was staying there, um, a woman by the name of Mrs. Newsom, and uh, they continued on. The carnage continued. I could go on with each and every house they stopped at and each and every victim, uh, but I think you get the point. This was really gruesome. Um, as the murdering continued, they did start to arm themselves with muskets and pistols. Uh, they stole horses from the victims. And I got to say, you know, again, this is probably going to go uh, against everything that people are trying to say about slavery and all that, but um, the slaves were kind of caught in the middle. Some did join Nat Turner. Most, however, tried to protect their masters. It, it's very hard to fathom the American chattel slavery system because, yes, there were those like Nat Turner um, and those who joined him, and there's probably a lot of slaves that wish they could, and there was others that protected their master. And they really got put in the middle, um, and there are accounts during this rebellion of slaves hiding their masters to protect them. I guess you could say that Nat Turner's rebellion came to a head and then really started to peter out when they arrived at the home of Dr. Blunt. Um, him and his sons, in the dark, so this had to be uh, the night of, the, of Monday night, because uh, this rebellion only really lasted two days and two nights. Um, Dr. Blunt and his sons, and believe it or not, according to Clifford Dowdy's book, um, Dr. Blunt gave his slaves a choice of fighting to defend the home and the family or not, and unanimously all of the male slaves voted to defend the home. And a small battle, a shootout, I don't know what you want to call it, skirmish, uh, if even that, ensued. And uh, several of Turner's men uh, were shot, some were killed, some were wounded. And that really did bring about an end to Turner's rebellion. It also didn't help the rebellion that by this point in time, 3,000 state militia were mobilized. Mobilized very quickly and between... Um, not getting the support that Turner thought he was going to get in terms of a slave uprising, the 3,000 militia, and basically being wanted by every white person in the region, um, the rebellion fell apart. Now, as for Turner himself, he eluded capture for about six weeks. And um, he was caught in October. He was given a, a rather quick trial, 
uh, that concluded in early November and he himself was hung on November 11th, 1831. Kind of surprising that would later become Veterans Day in America. So what can we say about this? Well, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, that this really starts to put faces and names on slavery. And it did startle just about every slave owner in the country. Remember, slavery existed not just in the 11 states that would later secede in 1860 and 1861, but you gotta remember, slavery did exist in border states like Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, also into New Jersey, Delaware. Um, by 1831, uh, my home state now, Pennsylvania, had just a few years earlier made slavery illegal. So it starts to bring the issue of slavery to the forefront. And we're going to see how this issue will create the issue of slave, uh, states' rights that will help tear apart uh, the United States of America. I want to thank you for watching. I appreciate uh, any comments that you might put below on this topic. I'm um, going to continue on. Uh, next, we're going to look at probably uh, the nullification crisis of 1832. And also, we're going to see how uh, this issue of slavery starts to separate the country. And it's really going to come about because of Northerners. We're going to see how... Uh, by the 1840s with the Great Awakening, we start to see what the South will refer to as Northern aggression. So I hope you will uh, tune in for those later on. For Civil War Reports, I am your War of the Rebellion reporter, Brian Thomas Kopak. Thank you for watching and have a great day. And I hope 2024 is treating you well. And if you like what you saw today, please hit the subscribe button. Give a thumbs up. Also, notify your friends. Let them know about this channel and ask them to subscribe as well. If you like, you may leave a question or a comment below. And perhaps I will answer your question in a future episode of Civil War Reports. Until next time, please keep the history alive.